Excellent. Thank you, Wendy, very much. And uh, good morning to everyone. For, and thank you for joining us for another week. I was actually a little bit sad this morning when I woke up because I was realizing this is week five out of eight. So in the first four, it's kind of exciting that we're like building up, we're building up. And, and now we're like, it's the Wednesday of the week. We're starting to head towards the end. So I'm a little bummed, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on all the good stuff we have uh, going on for you today. Um, as we mention every week, for those that are new to the call, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat icon. Uh, if you would, as you're listening to our presenters today, go ahead and click on that chat icon with any questions that you have relative to their presentations or their topic. And then Wendy will host a Q&A session at the end of our, uh, our um, time this morning. So go ahead and use that chat feature at any time uh, and Wendy and the team will keep track of those. Also, for those of you that were here last week, we had a little homework for you. Remember, uh, Jennifer from Horizon Behavioral Health shared a lot of really good ideas on how we can take care of ourselves from a mental health perspective, and I'll, I'll steal from Wendy, uh, how we can survive and thrive. Uh, so how do we help ourselves? So we, we mentioned that we were gonna do a little check-in. So if you would, on the chat feature as well, Send a quick little note as to what you did for yourself this week to help you survive and thrive during these uh, pandemic times. And so while you're doing that, I'll introduce our lineup for today. Of course, we will start with our friends from Central Health, as always, with our COVID-19 updates. So Christy, Lucy, thank you very much for being here again. We look forward to, to chatting with you. Um, after Christy, we'll have a visit from Virginia Career Works. Uh, for the central region, we have Ben Bowman and Tim Saunders, who will join us and uh, share some information around some of the programs that are available in the region and, uh, and what we can do for our workforce in this region during this time. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this week. And then lastly, we've got a presentation <coughs> excuse me, on the emergency leave overview. Uh, from our friends at Woods Rogers Attorneys at Law. So we have uh, Victor Cardwell and Leah Stigler this morning to join us. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming in. So uh, with that, let me go ahead and, uh, and pop it over to Wendy for just a minute to see if we have any folks that have shared a chat. While Wendy, while you're looking at the chat, I can let you know that I dug into my drawer in my, uh, my room and found this harmonica that I got for myself years ago. Um, and so I am teaching myself through some uh, YouTube videos on how to play the harmonica. And so, you know, if you can breathe, if you can breathe out and breathe in, you can play a harmonica. That's my attitude anyway. So that's helping my mental health. Anything else that we got from the crowd, Wendy, on, uh, on what folks have done to help themselves out? We absolutely do have some great ones. So Tracy Lido made a killer stir fry. Cooking is her calm and that's great. Uh, awesome. I know that her family, everyone, her husband, they are such fabulous chefs. And we've got Rachel uh, Tobin said she thrives and surviving and she hit her 10,000 steps for her goal. Nice. Wonderful. And Michelle says uh, hello to everyone and evening walks so that's a good thing but, uh jamie reynolds said played basketball with his kids that's wonderful oh, nice. great to be outside and then victor says to survive and thrive he's taking a a lot of spin bike video classes awesome trying nice, to see victor. that's great and then uh melissa uh, she's got a weekly she t gets weekly quotes inspirational and and also evening walks as well excellent congratulations to everybody and and uh for those that shared thank you very much um for others that maybe it slipped your mind last week or you're just joining us this week for the first time um the again the theme from from horizon behavioral health was what can we do to learn something new to engage our brains uh, what can we do that we're really passionate about? Like cooking is my calm. That's awesome, right? So that does good for you and it does good for others as well. So think about what you can do to take care of yourself. With that, 
let's learn about what Centra is doing these days to take care of all of us in our region. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen and bring up your presentation. Ms. Christy, thank you again for joining us. Happy to be here as always. Um, Michael sends his regards. He does enjoy doing these presentations, but unfortunately he was called away for a meeting this morning and couldn't join us. But um, just a quick share as far as um, my surviving and thriving. I'm a horse enthusiast and uh, being at the barn around the horses is my calm. And I actually got back on a horse for the first time in a year. Uh, was a little awesome. sore a couple of days after, but um, I love being able to, to take that time and get back on a horse. So. Awesome. All right. Um, I would like to start uh, with the, the first slide that everyone has seen, those of you who've been on the call before. Um, this is our um, way to flatten the curve, making sure that we have enough protective equipment for the healthcare workers. Um, uh, I wanted to make sure I always include it just so that, you know, Michael doesn't get upset at me. Um, <laughs> The next slide is uh, just to show you how things change. So the only, the only constant right now is the fact that change happens. Um, from last week to this week, this curve has changed on the, on the projection that I've shown you. According to this, and I pulled it last night, um, this projection shows our peak hospital resource use as of yesterday. So we'll have to watch the numbers and see if that actually does start trending down um, from yesterday and see how it how it goes from here. But you can see how that curve continues on um, through May and doesn't really hit the bottom until the beginning of June. And as far as um, cases in the state of Virginia, uh, just another comparison as we've been doing each week, just to kind of show you um, how the cases have increased um, across the state of Virginia. Um, in regards to total cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, um, and the total number of folks tested. The next slide, I wanted to provide numbers in a little bit different way um, than previous weeks. So for our Central Virginia region, uh, specifically, we have had 99 cases. 21 of those cases are in Bedford County. Um, so far, still only one death reported in the, the Central Virginia Health District. Um, and the, the numbers that I have access to, as far as Lynchburg General Hospital, we do have five um, COVID positive patients in our medical ICU, um, eight patients in our um, step down floor, which means that they are recovering. Um, to date, we, we have not seen evidence of a surge, but we're cautiously optimistic that we won't have a, a surge, but of course, we're still prepared for that. Um, at Bedford Memorial, of course, since we are transferring all of our positive patients to Lynchburg General, um, just wanted to give information about our testing because we have a, a drive-through testing site. Um, and then we also have a, a STIP tent where we test patients and we test patients in the ER. So um, since, since we have started testing at our site, we've had 139 total tests with 133 negative and four positive um, that we specifically tested here. Um, things that we're continuing to work through and look at. Um, we do have challenges in having testing supplies. Um, we've been having trouble with um, having supply issues on the, the reagent from our vendor. So we are working on in-house testing that is going kind of a start and stop limited basis. Um, but we're hoping that that will start picking up steam and continuing in the next few weeks. Um, cloth masks um, as a, as a Health system, we are providing um, cloth masks to any patients and visitors upon request. Um, however, we are requiring that anyone that, that comes in receives a, a surgical mask, but they can, they can take a cloth mask home with them if they ask. Um, specifically to Bedford, there is a mask group. It's a, a Bedford COVID-19 mask group um, that has been working on making those homemade masks. They, they started out making for the hospital and we have been extremely grateful for them. We've sort of hit a, um, a plateau or kind of a, a steady rate. So uh, we know that that group is working on making masks for um, other organizations and communities. And um, I found out that they even got permission from the town. They are now making masks and putting them in um, Ziploc bags and hanging them from the trees in front of the town municipal building. Oh, 
Oh, wow. So just to let everyone know, if you know of someone that needs a cloth mask that does not have access to one, um, as, as often as they can, and they're still making them and now hanging them from the trees for the, the general public to be able to, to take home and use. Um, so I was really happy to, to hear about that. Um, as far as, uh, I don't know if anyone has seen the, the governor's order regarding elective procedures. That's one thing that we watch specifically so that we know when we can go back to doing elective um, surgeries. That has been extended to May 1, and um, that is mostly because of uh, the, the supply of personal protective equipment. If we start back with elective procedures, that will then eat up some of that supply. We do have a supply, but it, it's still a little bit staggered and limited how often we get it in. So we wanna make sure that, that we'll have enough when we open those elective procedures back up. Um, we are anticipating that that May 1 will be the last deadline extension from the governor so we're hoping that following um that may one we'll be able to go back to elective surgery so we'll see um as far as some communities in the area um the the senior nursing facilities i don't know if you how much you've seen on on the tv or in the news um we have not had a an outbreak in any of our centra senior nursing facilities um but we are closely watching those and um we have taken steps to prepare so that if we have any um, COVID positive patients that then need to, um, that then they need to, to rehab um, to a, a nursing facility, we've prepared Guggenheimer Nursing Home um, to, to accept those patients. And so what that means for Bedford is they've actually transferred some um, non-COVID patients from Guggenheimer to Oakwood Health and Rehab. So we're caring for those patients similar with the inpatient setting. We're caring for those patients so that Guggenheimer has capacity. As of yet, we haven't had that need, but we wanted to make sure it was in place in case we do. Um, we've also been working with some groups um, to make sure we know uh, how to provide care for the homeless population. The uh, Central Virginia Continuum of Care is a group that's managing um, that, and we've been working with them on standard operating procedures and one of our physicians is there, the, the kind of the medical director for that, so that we have a plan in place if there are um, population of homeless that test positive and, and have a place to go and something that, someone that can care for them. And then the lastly is just, um, we are working on future planning um, because we were preparing for this for the long haul. We know the, the, the trend will go down but then um, there, there might be small ebbs and flows in the future, in the fall, we're, we're, we've prepared now for, for what's happening now and we're looking to, to plan for the, the future for the rest of this year, um, how we will um, manage seeing COVID, COVID positive patients in the future. Very good. All right. Christy, thank you very much, greatly appreciated. And if you could, uh, please pass on our thanks to everyone in the, in the Centra system. Um, you know, from, from housekeeping to CNAs, to administration, to surgeons, everybody is, uh, is absolutely crucial and we greatly appreciate um, everyone kind of going into the, into the Lions Den every day on behalf of all of us. So thank you to you and, and everyone at Centra. Will do. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's shift to some information around Virginia Career Works for our central region. Uh, ben Bowman and Tim Saunders have some good information for us this morning on some of the programs that are going on and how we can uh, utilize some of these programs for our workforce. So thank you very much, gentlemen. I'll go back to screen sharing and, uh, and turn it over to the two of you. Yes. Good, good morning, good morning. Thank you, Scott, for facilitating this process. And uh, just a little bit of a, a background. Um, many folks, I'm sure, have heard about the Virginia Employment Commission and Department of Aging Rehab Services and Central Virginia Community College. Uh, basically, uh, when we talk about Virginia Career Work Central Region, this is the workforce system, your regional workforce system. And, and really, um, 
it's uh, my role and, and Tim's role to try to help uh, facilitate the communication between all these different partners that you see on the screen with the idea of providing the kinds of resources, supports, and connections that job seekers need to get ready for a career, as well as uh, to help the businesses out there find the right uh, and connect with the right talent to uh, meet their business needs. So. Um, what I would like to emphasize is that with what we're going through right now, <clears throat> we're keeping a, a real keen eye on what's happening with uh, folks who are uh, filing for unemployment benefits. And it's, uh, as, as you can imagine, it's quite staggering the, the impact that uh, is happening in our particular region right now. But I will emphasize that there is a team, and, and I think quite frankly, a very effective team that is working together uh, to make sure that we have uh, the resources in place to help people get connected with the benefits and information, uh, the financial assistance they need to get through this uh, particular time. So uh, what you see on the screen is all the partners that are working in sync to, to try to coordinate efforts. And I think most importantly, what we're looking for is, is the future as, as we move out of this and, and move back to a, a more active uh, uh, economic environment that, that we will have resources in place uh, to help people and you know get back into the workplace and certainly to help our employers get the skill sets they need so um, I'd like to uh, Scott if you can go on to the next slide uh, a thing that I'd really like to emphasize is that um, we are certainly having a lot of demand for our services and we're encouraging folks, if you do need to file for unemployment benefits, try to do it online through a website. We know that in some cases, especially in rural areas, that there's not a lot of good internet access. So one thing that we've worked hard on is trying to make sure that there's internet access available. So to that end, um, also on the website, I think Tim will probably talk about this a little bit, a little bit later, but. He's done a great job of pulling together on our website Wi-Fi hotspots throughout the region. So if you need to file for unemployment benefits, you can do that there. But if you also, and this is critical, if you need to or are able to telework and don't have the capabilities at home, uh, you can actually access some of these hotspots to upload projects, uh, check email and various things like that. So uh, we're trying to do what we can to make sure that folks uh, continue working uh, as much as possible. And so uh, certainly want to thank all those who have been involved in, in helping us build a, an effective network to allow people to telework and file for unemployment benefits. The other thing to emphasize is that when, when individuals do file for unemployment benefits, you still need to check in on a weekly basis. So there again, if you don't have internet access, you can access it uh, through any of the hotspots or by telephone. Uh, but there again, the phone, the phone systems are uh, extremely busy right now. Thank you, Scott. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's fair to say, I was just looking at the unemployment data that come out and this this slide is, is a little bit dated because uh, we actually have, uh, I think, over 14,000 folks in our region who have filed for unemployment benefits. Um, and the other thing is that if you have any questions, whether you're a business, uh, whether you're a person who is unemployed right now, visit our website, uh, Virginia Career Work Central Region, and uh, you will have access to a lot of information. We've tried to focus our website in such a way that it's easy to navigate uh, for either uh, the unemployed individual or for the business who's trying to get information on the potential impact and resources available to help employees. Okay. And uh, traditionally we, we have focused on, uh, you know, through the Virginia Employment Commission coordinating unemployment benefits and things like that, but we have had some financial assistance through uh, a rapid response uh, program and we've been able to make some funds available to businesses in the region who need uh, extra resources for you know sanitation and safety supplies uh, for telework needs for 
uh, for their employees and various things like that. And uh, so we've had uh, several businesses take advantage of that. That funding window is closed right now, but we do have some efforts underway uh, where we're trying to secure some funding for what they call the National uh, Dislocated Worker Emergency Grant. And when those funds become available, uh, some of the things we'll, we'll be doing is how can we train folks who have lost employment to reskill into some of the higher demand occupations that are in the area. I know right now there's a little bit of uh, uh, imbalance in the healthcare system, uh, just because of the, as Christy had mentioned, there's uh, been cancellations of elective surgeries and things like that. So there are some folks that are, are idle, but uh, we truly anticipate as we move forward that there will be a lot more demand, both in healthcare, especially those on, on the front lines, you know, personal service and things like that. Uh, those are very uh, difficult to, to maintain positions. So um, <clears throat> stay in tune with our website, uh, check there for updates and uh, we'll probably be doing some uh, regular updates uh, in the future, uh, not only on our website, but in, in other uh, various ways. So thank you, Scott. All right, Ben, you want me to take over? Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. <laughs> All right, so quick explanation here. I know many of you probably remember me. I'm Tim Saunders. I uh, worked for WDBJ7 for about 14 years. And last month, I had the great honor to come and work for the Central Virginia Workforce Development Board and Ben Bowman. Ben hired me to come work for him as his new business and community engagement and outreach coordinator. So I'm now working for the Central Virginia Workforce Development Board. We brand outwardly as Virginia Career Works, and that's a brand that I'm gonna be trying very hard to get out there in a wider way uh, over the coming months and years, but I'm very excited to be working for this organization right now. Under normal circumstances, I will be out hopefully meeting with many of our local employers, working with local economic development professionals to try and build up our workforce. Um, I'm gonna be working very closely with Ben and the board to carry out a number of initiatives and look forward to doing that during better times. But right now, one thing that we're really doing is trying to answer questions about unemployment. The Virginia Employment Commission is one of our partners uh, in our workforce efforts, and so we've been trying to answer questions that people have about unemployment. And I pulled together some numbers for you from the Virginia Employment Commission. I thought you might find it interesting to see who is filing for unemployment specifically in our region. Now, the Central Virginia Workforce Region is the city of Lynchburg and Bedford, Campbell, Amherst, and Appomattox counties. So within our region, this right there on your screen you see is a breakdown of who has been filing for unemployment or how many people have been filing for unemployment. And this is from the first week of uh, what we have kind of looked at as our pandemic uh, response, the pandemic lockdown that we've been going through. It started uh, March the 14th and the most recent data we have came out yesterday and that was for the week of April the 18th. And as you can see there, the breakdown mirrors trends that we're seeing nationally. The most impacted sector, at least in terms of unemployment claims, is our food preparation and serving related occupations. They account for 25% of all of the initial claims for unemployment filed in our region. Uh, I say initial claims because as Ben mentioned, when you file for unemployment, you have to file initially and then again every week to continue receiving benefits. So these numbers reflect those who filed initial claims between March the 14th, the week of March 14th, and the week of April the 18th. So we have about 3,600 people in food preparation and serving occupations who filed claims for unemployment. That is followed by people who work in administrative support occupations, people who do office type jobs. They account for 14% of our overall breakdown of uh, unemployment claims. And then you've got sales and related occupations and production pretty close in terms of numbers. Both represent about 10%, as well as personal care and service occupations. You'll notice in there, we also have several healthcare related occupations uh, that also have around 1,000 people filing claims for unemployment. And rounding things out, we've got people who work in transportation and material moving, 
and installation maintenance and repair. So that's, those are the most impacted sectors in terms of people who have been filing for unemployment in our region. If you go to the next slide, you can see, if you go back there, you can actually see specifically for Bedford County. And I wanna point out here that this is a trend that we're seeing across the state right now. I was looking at the claims for unemployment that have been filed in Virginia, and it does appear, according to the Virginia Employment Commission and the numbers that they have available, that we actually peaked, or they believe that we peaked in terms of the number of people filing those initial claims for unemployment the week of April the 4th. And as you can see, specifically in Bedford County, we peaked with around 986 claims that week. And the numbers have gone down since then. The most recent week that we have available, April the 18th, it appears that we had about 474 workers in Bedford County who filed for unemployment. I looked at a heat map that the Virginia Employment Commission had that showed where the largest number of claims were coming from, and it sort of follows the population trends around the county. Where we're more densely populated, you are seeing more claims. Uh, the eastern part of Bedford County had a larger number of claims than other parts of the county, uh, just in, in terms of that heat map. But again, that has to do with the density. There are more people living on the eastern side of the county than in some other parts where it's a little more rural. Uh, but as of right now, we do have lower numbers of people filing initial claims for unemployment than other parts of the state. Uh, so this is the way it's breaking down in Bedford County. Closely related to unemployment is something called pandemic unemployment assistance. This is something new that just became available in Virginia. It's provided under the CARES Act that was passed in March by Congress. And each individual state is responsible for uh, deploying this uh, in their individual labor systems or employment systems. In Virginia, we call it the Virginia Employment Commission, and they just rolled this out on, or this previous weekend. So this is now available, and this is an unemployment benefit for people who wouldn't qualify for traditional unemployment. Normally, unemployment is not available for people who are self-employed or are part of the gig economy, people who drive for Uber, people who are independent contractors who have a business where they are their only employee. Normally, they would not be able to file for unemployment, but under the CARES Act, they can file a claim for something called pandemic unemployment assistance. And Virginia has a separate portal for people who want to file those claims. The amount of money, the benefit that they would receive would be comparable to that regular unemployment amount that they would be getting if they qualified for that. But the thing that people need to understand is if they want to file for this, they have to file for traditional unemployment first and be denied that before they can file a claim for the PUA as it's called. So keep that in mind if you're trying to share this information with people that you know that may be self-employed or if you're hearing questions from people about, hey, I thought the CARES Act provided this. It wasn't available in recent weeks. Uh, earlier this month, we were getting a lot of questions through Virginia Career Works about this. And we were having to tell people to be patient, just wait, we will have this available at some point. It is now available. So pass along the word to anyone you know that this may apply to, that they can receive this benefit until the end of July as of right now. And they will also, if they qualify for PUA, just like the people who qualify for traditional unemployment, they will also be able to receive that additional $600 benefit that is provided under the CARES Act as well. That's a separate benefit and they would qualify for that in addition to whatever amount they qualify for under the PUA or regular unemployment. Mm -hmm. So again, if you have questions about unemployment, we welcome you to get in touch with us. You see my email there on the screen as well as Ben. Ben is our Director of Workforce Development for our region. Again, I am the Business Engagement and Outreach Coordinator. I'll be hopefully, again, out in the community talking to you all about ways that we can build up our workforce. I hope to be able to help find workers that can fill some of these in-demand jobs that you have in the community. And I also look forward to connecting workers with training opportunities, people who want to enter the workforce, and our youth who want to stay here and have productive careers. I look forward to engaging with them and connecting them with the training opportunities that will allow them to be productive members of our society. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Scott. 
All right, thank you uh, both to Ben and to Tim, greatly appreciated. And a lot of benefits there that I think a number of organizations, a number of individuals can take advantage of. And, uh, and also, you know, probably a lot of people didn't even realize if they didn't qualify for traditional unemployment that there is an option there too. So uh, again, thank you to both of you. Tim, also thank you for sharing your, your former background with uh, WDBJ. I knew I knew you from somewhere and I could not put the pieces together. I'm like, where do I know this guy from? And I'm like, ah, oh, that Tim Saunders. So thank you very much. Good to have you with us and, uh, and enjoy your, your new role in our community. All right, so with that, let's, uh, let's move on to some perspective around the emergency leave overview. We're gonna start with uh, Leah and then uh, have some time with Victor as well. So thank you again to both of you from Woods Rogers Attorneys at Law. And I'll pull up the uh, presentation here for you guys to speak to as well. Awesome, thank you so much everyone. Um, my name is Leah and Victor, I hope y'all can see him on the screen um, somewhere. Victor, say hello. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, oh yeah, we can hear Perfect. you. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much for having us. Uh, yeah, we're here to give a brief overview of the emergency leave. Hopefully many of you guys are familiar with this already. Um, and then we'll have a fair amount of time for, for Q&A. So, so please shoot us questions throughout or, or at the end. Um, and we'll kind of just go back and forth. I'll, uh, so I'll just start, you know, this was something that came, in, came into effect April 1st. Uh, I know there was a lot of rush, employers trying to figure out what to do. Um, there are essentially two laws, uh, which is unfortunate because it would be nice to just have one simple law for all of us employers to deal with. But there are two laws. One is the paid sick leave law, and, um, and that essentially provides 80 hours of paid sick leave for various reasons, which we'll get into. Um, and the other is emergency family medical leave, which is an amendment to the, uh, the regular family medical leave um, for your 12 weeks of family medical leave. This doesn't just apply to employers with, you know, 50 employees like you would with regular FMLA, um, but any, any employers with under, uh, 500 employees or all public employers. Um, and so we'll get into some of the reasons for the paid sick leave and the family medical leave. Yeah, and um, just to dovetail what Leah said, please keep in mind that the, the FMLA really does apply to anybody who is covered. Um, and so for those of you who are always trying to avoid that number of 50, you're still covered too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We get that that question about well, what if my employees are not within a certain radius, hundred mile radius, and all that? Boom, out the window with EFMLA. Um, so with the paid sick leave aspect, there's uh, six reasons, but really only five of them matter. Um, the first is you're subject to a federal, state, or local, you know, government order. Um, a lot of that we're seeing orders from Virginia Department of Health. Our firm has. Uh, created a pretty good partnership with um, Molly O'Dell, who's the director of infectious disease um, in this area. And, uh, you know, one thing that they're doing is when they have an employee who tests positive, they are actually issuing an agreement with the employee. So the employee gets an agreement that kind of outlines essentially what they're supposed to do for the next 14 days. Um, and then, the, um, and so part of that is this, this order, you know, they must stay home. Um, Reason two is that you're basically a healthcare provider has asked you to self quarantine. That's probably one of the most common ones we're seeing. Um, it's very easy to get that right now. A lot of employers are having their employees are at home. Maybe they've got a symptom or so, and they call in the healthcare provider um, saying, "Hey, you know, my my spouse has it. You know, what should I do?" And the healthcare provider easily tells them, "Stay home. You don't even really need a doctor's note." Um, the third reason is they're experiencing symptoms uh, and seeking a medical diagnosis um, and see that all the time. Again, you don't even need a doctor's, a doctor's note. It's, you know, I've got a cough, I've got, I feel weakness, I've lost my appetite, um, and really the employer needs to defer to the employee and say, okay, stay home, you're entitled to leave. If I could interrupt real quickly, I'd go back to number two. We'll tell you that we are seeing employers who are asking questions about number two, and they're worried about the abuse element. Um, you know, a person saying that I have a condition, or my doctor is telling me to stay home because I suffer from asthma, or whatever. And frankly, in this in this pandemic era, and I know my friends at Central will agree, 
you, you, we don't have the opportunity to, to really dig too far into that type of issue. If somebody says they're sick, we're pretty much going to believe them at that word, unless from an employment standpoint, we have a reason to question their veracity. And that may come later, but right now, if somebody is sick, stay home. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the, I, I'll just cover this one then, Victor, I'll let you touch on the EFMLA. Um, but uh, for reason number four, to care for an individual, <clears throat> excuse me, to care for an individual um, for, you know, in reason one or two, so basically in, in another individual, let's say a spouse or a child or even a roommate, it's actually much broader than just family members um, who's maybe been told by a healthcare professional um, uh, to self-quarantine. <clears throat> yeah, and real quickly, the reason number five, and this is where those two laws sort of come together the paid sick leave and then the emergency family medical leave. The paid sick leave number five is to care for a child whose school has closed or whose caretaker is unavailable. So I think everywhere throughout this region, all the schools have closed. Um, the governor took care of that a long time ago. So we know that's there. But they also have to have an inability to have a, a, someone take care of their child. Um, so they'll be entitled to the 80 hours of paid sick leave for the care of that child if they, if they have no other alternatives. That, transitions us. Well, before I get to family medical leave, let me just give you the, the six reasons. So many people um, they say there were six reasons. Well, the six reasons, I don't think any of us know what it means. It simply means that there's a condition that, that Health and Human Services or DOL or Treasury say is important enough, they'll do something else with it. So for all practical purposes, there are five legitimate reasons to get paid sick leave, and then we'll transition to the family medical leave real quickly. Um, and the family medical leave, is that situation again where the where only here where the child is <clears throat> out of school and you have to take time off to care for the child. You have to demonstrate in some way or state in some way that that child is, um, you have no other alternative daycare um, alternatives. Um, so for example, and one issue we came across is we had an employee whose spouse worked for one entity and the employee worked for a second entity. Well, the first spouse was able to get off of work so the employer, the employee at the second entity could not take off during that same corresponding time. They had to work together. We asked for documentation and the law allows us to ask for specific things that's on the slide right now. The name, the date of which a leave is requested, the reason for the leave, i.e. I can't take care of my child, they're unable to work for qualified reasons, and then the employers and all of you I'm sure are worried about the tax credits and we're still looking at those things too. And, and I'll add with this documentation, um, these guidelines as to what an employer needs to have in their own file when an employee takes leave under the, any of these two laws, um, uh, these came out from the IRS, right? And so in order to get that refundable tax credit, you want to make sure that you're getting, giving, getting the right information from the employee. Um, I'm sure many of you have created forms or you already have paid sick leave forms. Don't use them shoot us an email um, and we will go ahead and send them out or maybe we can send them um, to Wendy or someone who can get, give them out to the team with the PowerPoints. Our, our authorization form is awesome. It's our little baby and it really covers everything you need, uh, you need to have to get that tax credit. Um, something interesting on that that might make come in through the questions is, uh, you know, for the, the family medical leave aspect, as Victor said, you know, you have to certify that there's no one else available to care for the child. So you can't have, you know, if your spouse is already on it, you know, you can't adequately certify that you need to also stay home to take care. Um, and then for kids, if you have a kid that's over uh, the age of 14, you have to also certify that your child has special circumstances where you need to be home to take care of them. Um, 14 is a little young. I don't remember necessarily being home alone at 14, but maybe I was. <laughs> so anyways, please shoot us an email or we'll shoot that form out. It's very helpful. Scott, I'm calling on you there. Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, so the last thing that just to cover real quickly, uh, intermittent leave, the, we added one special slide because um, we've been getting a ton of questions on this, which is, you know, how, how does intermittent leave come into play with these issues? Um, and this has really been flushed out through the guidance. Um, so 
if somebody is out for reasons one, two, three, or four, pretty much anything other than taking uh, care of a child whose school is out, um, they cannot use leave intermittently back into the workplace. So if I go to a factory every day and I'm working there and I start to experience symptoms, I can I, I should not be using that leave intermittently where, you know, because that's the 14 day sort of CDC quarantine. Now, if I'm out for four or five days with symptoms and I get tested and my test comes back negative, then you can discuss whether you want to cut off the paid sick leave, sort of bank it back up in case someone does, they experience symptoms again, and you want to keep them out until they're, let's say, free of symptoms for 72 hours, or a, a healthcare provider says they can come back to work, right? Um, yeah, I, sorry, what I would, yeah, what I would say to you is that there are going to be so many unique circumstances that you have to address on a case-by-case -case basis that you just want to be careful with this. Again, I think Congress intended for these to be big blocks of leave, unlike the FLA that most of us are know and love or sarcastically hate. Um, but the fact is, you have to just be careful that um, you, you listen to the employee and you don't have to use intermittent uh, except for unique circumstances. I think each time you talk to an employee, you'll get that. I see a question down here. I teach a babysitting class. I train babysitters and kids to stay home by themselves starting at age 11. Well, <laughs> 20, the 2020 kid is a whole lot better than the, I'm not going to say my age, than the 30-year-old kid. Um, yeah, by 11, you hope they can stay home by themselves, but fortunately, Congress at least gave you the 14 for those of us who have kids who are 16 and 17. I still don't want home. <laughs> but the I would special say, case there could be the boyfriend or the girlfriend of your child, and that's why well you want to be home. Yeah, very, yeah. Very well could be, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, I think you should just be able to certify that if your child uh, can't make a hot pocket by himself, then you probably need to be home. <laughs> um, yeah, I, just, I think, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to finish up the intermittent leave part. You know, if an employee is teleworking, which I know a lot of employers have employees working remotely, um, you can be a lot more flexible with the intermittent leave. You pretty much can allow intermittent leave for all these reasons you know if the employee's out because they've they've got symptoms or they're caring for somebody um, but they're not sick enough that they can still work you know but maybe it's just a few hours a day because they're exhausted then yeah you can allow them to use it more intermittently when they're at home so and any questions i'll shoot one to victor that's that's a good one that we get a lot which is how does the real FMLA come into play here? Um, you know, with, with employers and HR professionals who are trying to put coding into their systems for leave, should they code it as EFMLA, as EPSL? Should they also code it as FMLA? And when does the, F, the regular 12 weeks of FMLA come into play, Victor? Yeah, very quickly, and again, I don't, we don't want to hijack this, but as an overriding statement, do keep in mind that all the laws that apply to us before the pandemic still apply. Uh, you have your FMLA issues, you have your ADA issues, all those things are still there. And, and not to ignore that question, because I think that's an important question, keep in mind those same privacy rights and privacy concerns for private employers still apply too. Um, you know, we've got so many questions where people are ready to run to the hills shouting, I've got a COVID-19 patient, I've got a COVID-19 patient. That person has privacy expectations and rights also that are not just HIPAA, because HIPAA doesn't apply to 99% of the people on, this, on this, this chain. Our friends at Centra, they know HIPAA well, but for the rest of us, it doesn't. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. With regard to the regular FMLA, do keep in mind, the regular flu is not covered by the FMLA unless you're off for over three days and you're receiving some type of prescription from a doctor. But this time does all run concurrently. The family, emergency family medical leave didn't ex extend the FMLA. You still get 12 weeks of leave. And so you want to code this stuff, as, as I think that's a great question. If you have the capability of, of coding the paid sick leave, do so. But also code the, the family medical leave, you know, in, in some joint way so that you're not adding hours to your obligation. Um, all those things become important as we start to ramp back up to work. Very good. Leah and, and Victor, thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. And, uh, and thank you to the, the team at Woods Rogers.
and again, it, it, thank you for the offer of, of sending the form uh, or form templates over to Wendy for her distribution, because I think that is, that's crucial too, right? We wanna make sure we have the right documentation, especially when the, the IRS is involved. So uh, greatly appreciated there as well. So thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, great information this week. Again, keep on rocking it. Wendy, I don't know where you find all these people, but keep on keeping on. We'll turn it back over to you for some uh, potential question and answer period here, and then uh, we'll wrap it up for week five. Oh my goodness, another great call. I, I have to brag on you guys because seriously, I learn stuff every week. So thank you to our experts who really are experts in their field and we're blessed that you are sharing the knowledge so that other people can benefit. Uh, I wanna announce some of our up and coming calls that we will be, so next week is May 1st, that next Friday. And we've got Mike Miller that's coming on, our sheriff, and he'll give us an update on the county. Karen Woodford is with Bedford County Public Schools in response what they're doing uh, in regards to the COVID-19 and maybe she'll give us some dates of things coming up. Also, uh, Michael Elliott will be back with Centra or, or Christy. We're going to start putting both of y'all's names on there just so you know, because uh, you know <laughs> you both come on and you can come on together too. So be a duo. And then Mary Zirkel with the town of Bedford will come on as well and give us an update and also talk to us about some financial assistance they'll be able to provide as well. So you wanna stay tuned for that. And then we've got some great HR and HR. Uh, uh, Rachel Tobin will be back with us on May the 8th. We are also gonna have a call strictly on marketing that's coming up on the 15th. So everyone that's on the call that week, including LaShonda, uh, about 90 Marketing, everyone that's on there will be talking about different ways that you can market in this environment. And it will be power packed. I will let you know right now, you don't wanna miss any of these calls because truly uh, we are here to serve you and wanna make sure that you are uh, not only surviving, but that you will be thriving, coming out of the emergency mode into the recovery mode. And that's what we're here to do. And Bedford Area Chamber is here bringing everyone together to discuss and tackle these crucial issues related to the COVID-19. And we, we hope that we're doing it well, but please let us know if there's an issue that you would like us to cover, uh, please let us know that as well, because we can add some calls uh, later. Let's see, Rachel has a question and about non-contact positive at a daycare. Does that fall under emergency paid sick leave? And that question, I guess, would be Leah or Victor. Yeah. I'll start since I'm unmuted already. Rachel, thanks for throwing us a hard question right away. Um, a, a couple things. First and foremost, you know, how the disease is contracted or, or passed along um, doesn't necessarily drive the paid sick leave question. You know, the paid sick leave question is the person has COVID-19, they've been diagnosed or they've been told to stay home, you know, by the healthcare provider for reasons associated with it. So <clears throat> generally speaking, and maybe there's some magic to non-contact that I'm missing. Um, and so I'll invite you or anybody else to clarify that part for me. But, you know, I saw the news the other day that there was a, a child at a, at a daycare center who tested positive and, um, and had been there for a couple of days. So I'm anticipating we'll see more of, of, of those types of, of issues. But how it's transmitted is nowhere near as important as simply having a healthcare provider diagnose you and or tell you to stay home for particular reasons. <clears throat> I'm not tossing this over to my friends at Centra Healthcare Providers, but it's still my understanding and view that testing is not as, as omnipresent as you might think it is when you watch certain press conferences out of certain buildings in Washington, D.C. The tests are still being given to, to, to emergency responders, to healthcare providers, and for regular John and Susie Q public, you need to be sent there by a physician, your healthcare provider of some sort, who says, yes, you have the symptoms for other things. We, we've ruled out regular flu. We've ruled out you know, pneumonia or, or, or strep throat or whatever things I can't think of that's when you can get a test. So tests are just not falling off the trees. Um, I know people are working hard to get tests, but it takes me back to the question, the, the non-contact or however that may have been um, passed along, is not the issue, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just simply that they have the COVID-19. 
Yeah, Victor, I think she clarified it there uh, while you were talking. She said basically she had an employee, or this is what I think she's saying. She, had, you, she has an employee who has a child, and that child's in a daycare center and in, one, in room A, and the daycare center announces that there is a child that was in room B who tested positive. Um, I, as Victor said, you know, I don't necessarily think our sort of presumption of the how it broke down comes into play. Um, I do think, you know, each employer really should be doing their own contact tracing. So Virginia Department of Health is going to be taking the lead dealing with that, po that positive child um, and kind of reaching out and making sure any people that were any other kids that were a part of that kid kids area um, that was a cl close contact that those people and those kids are, are, are um, at home. And now if, if it comes out that maybe they were passing in the hallway, they were using the same bathroom and that kind of thing, the two kids in room A and room B, in room B um, or that there was an employee going between, you know, room A and room B or something, um, then I think you do want to defer and possibly, you know, if that, if that employee, your employee's child is going to be home and, and quarantined and not able to go to the daycare center, right. um, then I think, yeah, that, that, that employee would either be entitled to um, the 80 hours of paid sick leave under EFMLA, um, as well as uh, just regular, the, the EFMLA, um, uh, you know, 10 weeks or whatever, how long that, that child needs to quarantine. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and real quickly, um, and our friends at Central can, can do this even better, but we understand that the definition of a close contact um, has changed, just evolved. I mean, now it's within six feet for, I think it's down to 10 minutes. It used to be 30 minutes at one point in time by the Department of Health, maybe CDC. I see CDC still has some information about a close contact, six feet within 30 minutes. I know that time has been reduced, at least according to the Department of Health, and I'll ask my friends from Central to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down and tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, and, and when it comes, I, I generally think more in clinical settings, you know, we have our precautions as to, yeah. you know, when you're within six feet, whether it's um, a, a droplet versus aerosol transmission and, and clinical things of that nature. But yeah, yeah for the, the general public, it's, it's within six feet and yeah, the time has dropped down from 30 minutes. And the co other comment I'll make there, though, Rachel, to your point, and I, I think Leah hit on it, we're talking about a daycare center. So we're talking about kids, and I love kids, but kids are nasty. Um, <laughs> I've got two, okay, so I can say that. And so I, I, think it's, I think I would be more lenient with my employee um, who says my child was in this facility. I mean, we see the, the constant spread in nursing homes, but I think daycare facilities, they would frankly cause me grave concerns because kids, kids play, kids grab, kids touch, you know, and, and 10 minutes to a kid seems like 30 seconds or, or whatever. So I think I would just pay attention. And if the employee came to me and said, this is what happened, um, they go to the healthcare provider, healthcare provider gives them whatever advice they give them, I'd follow from that lead. The one thing I will say, and I'll stop talking is, the one thing I have heard and I believe so much is we can't let the fear of immediate transmission cause us to, to, you know, not interact. I mean, you know, that's, there's a reason why six feet at minutes and in healthcare, the air was so safe. I can't say that word, but when the droplets fly in the air, thank you, right? You know, that's, that's a different issue for the person that has symptoms. But um, thank you. There's a lot to it. Thank you, Scott. Awesome. Uh, Miss Wendy, any other last questions you want to touch on? I know we got a, it looks like a bunch of chats coming in this week, and uh, is, we might have to kind of gather some of the answers and get those back out to everybody. But I uh, wanted to see if you had any last Q&A before we sign off for the week? Uh, I think we're good. We uh, Great questions, by the way. We appreciate those and because you're asking questions that other people need to know as well. Um, but uh, we did get a shout out to our panel experts. Someone said they thought this was the best one yet. So hats off to you guys. Awesome job. Way to bring it. And positive things are happening. You know, let's focus on that. I just say, be thankful every single day and say five things that you're thankful for. And I think that will help everyone and, and help you together. We are stronger. And let's keep Bedford in business and appreciate you. And just keep on keeping on and let us know how we can best help you. But thanks again for tuning in. And we wish you all the best, your families and your businesses. Be blessed.